four true 911 calls that will have you on the edge of your seat. A 10-year-old takes to the highway. An altercation with the police turns deadly and two domestic violence calls with fatal endings. But they're not what you expect. An 11-year-old boy led police officers on a dramatic speed chase after his mom took away his PlayStation. This was his second pursuit by the police. A witness called 911 the first time the child took to the highway. What's like 911? Hi, um, I'm pretty sure there's a car chase going on between a mom and a son right now on the highway. They're just passing Columbia Road exit. The kid's probably going at least 90, and he looks maybe 13. Okay, we already got a couple um, calls on this. Where are you guys at exactly okay. right now? Um, I'm heading west. They're heading west. They're like a few cars in front of me. Okay. Okay, you still on the phone with me? Yeah, I am. Okay. They're in... Um, well, it's like cars are like, passing Columbia at this time. It's like a maroon SUV or crossover, I don't know. Um. And then, like, a tiny silver car. She has her hazards on. It looks like they're slowing down right now, too. You see any mile markers yet in the middle of the highway there? Um, 158 over 4 is what I'm looking at. They're hitting the sign that says exactly a mile, Crocker Bassett Road, exit 156. Do you want me to keep following them? Or yeah, keep, just, if, you, if you okay. can keep an eye on them, it's going to help us out. Yeah, sure, why not? Mom's chasing them. Yeah, looks like it. I'm on the oh, he looks like he's going towards All right. the um, Crocker exit. Oh, never mind. He's just oh. swerving lane. All right. They're going past Crocker now? Yeah. All right. There's a guy next to me. I think he's calling, too. Westlake 911, what is your emergency? Yeah, they're, I'm on 90 West, and there seems to be what well, looks to be a child driving a silver infinity with, I don't know if it's like their mother or somebody almost chasing them down in a red SUV. Where are they um, at now? Uh, I'm going past the uh, drug mart on Detroit. Uh, I'm about to go past the Crocker Bassett exit. You're on 90? Yeah. Okay. And the yeah. kid's like, I don't know if it's like a kid is swerving in and out of traffic, almost ran a couple cars off the road. Right. Um, yeah, I'm literally just. So you're westbound? Yeah. Yeah, I'm behind a blue Jeep now, and I can see like the two cars uh, about a quarter mile ahead of me. We're still before the Crocker exit. Okay. They're still before um, Crocker. It's like the kids, I don't know. It's just like swerving in and out of lanes like crazy. And someone's chasing them. There's, it looks like it looks like a mother or something chasing them. Yeah. The young boy's first involvement with the police was in October 2017, when he stole his mom's car. According to police reports, he had been waiting for his sister to drive him to school. And when she did not show up, he lost his patience and stole his mom's car. What's like 911? Hi, um, I'm pretty sure there's a car chase going on between a mom and a son right now on the highway. They're just passing Columbia Road exit. The kid's probably going at least 90, and he looks maybe 30. What's like 911? What is your emergency? Yeah, there, I'm on 90 West, and there seems to be what well, looks to be a child driving a silver Infinity with, I don't know if it's like their mother or somebody almost chasing them down in a red SUV. The state patrol picked up on the chase as he entered Interstate 80, and at some point, a trooper pulled up next to the boy and instructed him to stop. According to the state trooper, the boy did not cooperate and sped up. He drove 100 miles per hour on I-90 through Cuyahoga, Lake, and Erie counties. <laughs> He's off road driving down the ditch. We're not going to let him get back on the highway. Traffic is stopped behind us. All right, he's just about out there sooner or later. Come on back on the road. How fast is he going? He's on the shoulder in the grass, riding in the ditch. We've got eight patrol cars here keeping him off the road.
Come on, bud, roll it down. Break the, break the window, break the window, break the window. I lost you. Break the window, clear, break the window. Oh, he's a, oh, he's got a Give me a time. I got it. Hey, hold on, we got it. We got it, we got it, we got it. It's just easy, bud. Easy, 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 easy. 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 Shocked drivers called Westlake police and reported the horrendous scene. Is this real life? You know, that's, that's kind of what it was. And uh, I was in shock. I just, I didn't know what to do or really. So, I mean, my first thing I did was I called the Westlake police and had them jump on it and they took care of the rest. The pursuit ended about one hour after he took off. Once the state troopers managed to stop the 10 year old, he was combative. Once they took him out, he was uh, kicking the troopers and then they uh, picked, him, picked his legs up and then uh, he started spitting on him. He left the scene unscathed. According to court records, he was charged and later the charges were dismissed. The judge hearing the case ruled that the child was incompetent to stand trial. Two weeks before this incident, he took his mom's car to Interstate 90 until three of his tires blew out. According to police reports, he took the car because he was bored. There he goes again, an 11-year-old behind the wheel of his parents' car, leading police on a dangerous high-speed chase. And it's not the first time he's done it. Months later, the young boy found himself in the same predicament. At around 10.45 p.m., he stole his mother's SUV after an altercation over his PlayStation. A Brooklyn police officer noticed someone pulling into the fire station and stopped to see if they needed help. The chase was called off 25 minutes when the boy crashed into a parked truck. The SUV flipped over and collapsed. The 11-year-old was taken to Metro Health, treated for scrapes and cuts on his hand and wrist. He was arrested after the crash, but no formal charges were filed. If you want to hear more stories like these, then hit that like and subscribe button to see all my new content. The Atlanta Police Department released a 911 call made from Wendy's parking lot where Rayshad Brooks got into an altercation with police officials and was later shot and killed. On the night of June 12, 2020, Officer Devin Brosnan responded to a complaint that Brooks was blocking a Wendy's restaurant drive through lane. Brosnan radioed Officer Garrett Rolfe for assistance. All right, you need police fire ambulance out here. I'm the police. Okay, tell me what's going on. Um, I have a car. I think he's intoxicated. He's in the middle of my drive-thru. I try to wake him up, but he, he's parked dead in the middle of the okay. drive-thru, so I don't know what's wrong with him. Is he breathing now? Do you know? Yeah, he woke up, looked at me, and I was like, you got to move out of the drive-thru because people can't. They're going around him. He's in the middle of the... Just right All there. All right. Ted, what kind of car are you So they're trying to go around him. What's the and car? And I asked him to pull over. You know, if he I had too much to drink to pull over and go to sleep, he said he went, they said he went right back out by walking in. What kind of car is it? It's a white car. He just said that he came in to me one Is he black? <laughs> is he black? Why is he right Yeah. Here? He black. Okay. In a white sedan in the middle of the drive through No. Let me see what kind of car it is. Right here. I, yeah, he, he's right here. The car's going around him. Okay. All right. Does he appear to have any weapons, ma'am? Ma'am? Does he appear to have any weapons from where, where you can see it? No, no, I think he's intoxicated. The dispute between Brooks and the officers was caught on body cam footage. What's up, my man? Hey, what's up, my man? You good? You don't need a ambulance or anything like that? Are you just tired? 
All right, man. Just, just I'll move my car. Just pull up. Just pull somewhere and take it now. All right. <laughs> I don't want to deal with this dude right now. Okay, how much did I drink tonight? Not much? How much is not much? Uh, about a drink, about 12 today. Alright, hey, do you have your license on you real quick? Yeah. Alright. Just, just relax the car. What are you, uh, are you just, are you here for a visit or what's, uh... I'm visiting. Where are you visiting? Uh, my mother's grave site. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. How, how long has she uh, passed for? It's, it's been probably about a year and a half now, but... Okay, I'm sorry to hear my that. My birthday just passed, and uh, my girlfriend's birthday just yeah. passed, but I, I went to visit her. And yeah. All right. We decided to eat Burger King tonight, and hey, this happened. Right, I, I hear you. I say, babe, what was going Right. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have, we're gonna talk to this officer here for a minute, and then uh, we'll be good to go. Okay? Oh no, no problem. All right, thank you, sir. All right, you stay in the car. Stay right there. All right. Hey, what's going on? So, found him passed out in the parking lot. He's sitting here. So he was in the drive. -thru. Yeah, he's, he's okay. on. Cars on. Took me like a few minutes to wake him up. Kept knocking. Opened the door. Like shook him. Woke up super groggy. Got you know pretty good smell of alcoholic beverage coming out of the car. Eyes are watery and glassy. Snorted his words. Wasn't really sure where he was. And uh, tell me he had one drink you said earlier. Tell me, I wasn't here, so can you tell me what uh, what That's happened it. before we got here? Five, six, seven. I can just go home. I have my daughter's there right now. My three, my daughter's birthday was yesterday. Right. Hold on, Miss Brooks. Will you take a preliminary breath test for me? Is yes or no? I don't want to refuse anything. Uh, it's yes or no. It's completely up to you. Yes, I will. Okay, just wait here while I grab. I what what kind eat. of drinks did you have? Uh, I'm not sure. It's something she ordered. She said top shelf or whatever. Top shelf what? I'm not sure. It was, like I said, it was her birthday and... You had about one and a half drinks, but you don't remember what kind of drinks they were? No, sir. All right. I really don't, Mr. Rock. All right, I think you've had too much to drink to be driving, so put your hands behind your back for me. Here, put your hands behind your back. DUI investigation. Okay, so there's only three officers on the outside. Yeah. To develop probable cause to arrest the suspect for DUI. He resisted arrest and he gained control of the other officer's taser and started running as I pursued him. He turned and started firing the taser at me. Okay. You good, you alright? Yeah. Still got the adrenaline pumping. Uh, you alright? No, I'm okay. Alright, good, 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 good. Alright, we're gonna take care of you, brother. I'm just glad you are right. That's my biggest concern. Yeah, we're good. All right, good. You talk to your wife? You talk to your family, everybody? No, I hadn't called anybody other than the IPPO. Okay. 
All right. Appreciate hopefully it. we'll get this cleared up. Anything right. you need from me? Any yeah. update on the on Mr. Brooks? No, I ain't checked yet, so okay. we'll get that squared away. All right? All right. But you're good. A few minutes after he was shot, an ambulance arrived and took Brooks to the hospital, where he died following surgery. Brosnan was treated for a concussion. In less than 24 hours after the man was shot and killed, Atlanta's Police Department Chief Erica Shields resigned. Mayor Bottoms said Shields had resigned in the hope that the city may move forward with urgency and rebuild the trust so desperately needed throughout our communities. Chief Shields has offered to immediately step aside as police chief so that the city may move forward with urgency in rebuilding the trust so desperately needed throughout our community. In the interim, Rodney Bryant, a 31-year-old Atlanta Police Department veteran, came out of retirement to serve as interim police chief. Rolf was fired, and Brosnan was placed on administrative duty. The Fulton County District Attorney, Paul Howard, announced 11 charges against Rolf. Felony murder, five counts of aggravated assault, four police oath violations, and property damage. Brosnan was charged with aggravated assault and two counts of violation of oath. Howard argued that the taser that Brooks had taken posed no danger. After being fired twice, it could not be fired again. It was also a violation of department policy for Rolf to begin handcuffing Brooks before telling him he was being arrested. Additionally, Howard said that Rolf and Brosnan failed to provide timely medical aid to Brooks for over two minutes. Policy that requires that the officers have to provide timely medical attention to Mr. Brooks or to anyone who is injured. But after Mr. Brooks was shot, for some period of two minutes and 12 seconds, uh, there was no medical attention applied to Mr. Brooks. Uh, but when we examined the videotape and in our discussions with what we discovered is during the two minutes and 12 seconds that Officer Rolf actually kicked Mr. Brooks while he laid on the ground. They're fighting for his life. Secondly, from the videotape, we were able to see that the other officer, Officer Brosnan, actually stood on Mr. Brooks's shoulders while he was there struggling for his life. Um, we were able to conclude that based on the way that these officers conducted themselves while Mr. Brooks was lying there, that the demeanor of the officers immediately after the shooting did not reflect any fear or danger of Mr. Brooks, but their actions really reflected other kinds of emotions. Brosnan was released on June 18th after posting a $50,000 signature bond. In an interview, the accused said the interaction with Brooks started peacefully. I felt he was friendly, he was, he was respectful, uh, you know, I was respectful to him, um, you know, and I felt like, you know, he just seemed like someone who potentially needed my help, and I was really just there to see what I could do for him and make sure that he was safe. The following day after charges against Rolf was announced, Atlanta police officers called in sick for their shifts staging a blue flu protest. In the four days from the 17th to the 12th, about 170 officers called in sick, and officers in the three out of the city's six police zones did not respond to calls. In an interview, Vince Champion, regional director of the International Brotherhood of Police Officers, said some officers are afraid to go to work and answer a call because they might face prosecution for doing their job. They think, you know, that this, this could be me, and I could be doing my job, and next thing I know, I'm fired because the mayor doesn't like what she saw, and then I'm facing murder charges because the DA didn't like what he saw. Atlanta Mayor Bottoms denounced this and called the blue flu protests stupid. Something stupid like that happens to basically tell officers to abandon their post, that is the height of dereliction of duty. Brooks's murder happened less than three weeks after George Floyd's death while in police custody. Floyd's death sparked nationwide protests against police brutality and racial injustice. 
The fatal shooting of another black man by the officers intensified the protests. Brooks became a potent symbol against police brutality. Protesters gathered at the shooting site beginning June 12 and set fire to Wendy's restaurant outside which Brooks was shot and several nearby cars and broke a television camera. Oh, it, it, it's, it's, it's tiring. It, it, it hurts. It hurts. But listen, man, we have to build, we have to build this nation all over again. Rapper T.I. joined protesters on the streets of Georgia over the weekend to demand justice for Brooks. I know we do a lot of talking about what separates us. I know we do a lot of talking about how far we have to go, but let's talk about what we've done. Let's talk about what we've done in such a short period of time. We have forced them to acknowledge the pain that has existed for years and years. We have forced them to take into account and consider what we've gone through ever since they brought us to this country. We have forced them to now be considerate of our, our lives, our liberties, and we can't let up off the gas. Now, I have a phrase, it's us or else. But I want to explain to you what that or else means. I'm going to just tell you, I care, that's why I'm here. I'm not a politician. I don't run no office. I don't do... None of the stuff that politicians do. I care. That's why I'm here. Amen. That's why I was at that press conference. That's why Killer Mike was at that press conference. Because we care. This is about us, and I feel like us together, united, yes, yes, is better than the strongest of us, yes, separated yes, and apart. That's right. Those at New Brooks remembered him as a caring father and an enthusiastic dancer. Before his death, Rashad Brooks focused on getting his life back on track after spending two years in prison. I just feel like some of the system could, you know, look at us as individuals. We do have lives, you know, we're, it's just a mistake we made, you know, and, you know, not, not just do us as if we are animals. At his funeral, the Reverend Dr. Raphael G. Warnock said Brooks wasn't just running away from the police. He was running away from a system that makes slaves out of people. The Reverend continued to say that this is much bigger than the police. This is about a whole system that cries out for renewal and reform. On July 6, police and sanitation workers began to remove the memorial to Brooks at the place of his death. The burned Wendy's was demolished. Georgia Law Enforcement Organization, a law enforcement nonprofit, began raising funds for Rolf to pay his legal fees, raising $500,000. Rolf was released on July 1 on a $500,000 bond with conditions. In May of 2021, the Atlanta Civil Service Board reinstated Rolf as an APD officer, saying he was not afforded due process in his firing. Kent police officer Sarah Berkeley called 911 to report that she had just shot and killed her ex-boyfriend after breaking into her house. She told the first responders that she shot the man twice after he broke into her home. May I help you? May I help you? Ma'am? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Okay. 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 
Ma'am. Oh my God, he came over. He, he broke in. And he was beating me up. I shot him. Please. Okay. All right. We have how on the way. What is your address, please? <laughs> I knew I officers arrived at Berkeley's residence in Highwood Avenue. They heard the 30-year-old screaming and two gunshots followed after that. According to the police, Berkeley's ex-boyfriend, Adam Jovacic, broke into her home overnight and started attacking her. Berkeley and 29-year-old Jovacic met while at Stowe High School. They began dating two years ago after they bumped into each other at the natatorium in Cuyahoga Falls. Berkeley found out that Jovacic was living with another woman, whom he eventually married. She ended the relationship after that revelation, but they stayed in contact while broken up. Berkeley told investigators that she spoke with Jovacic to support him while he battled alcoholism and other times when he threatened to harm or kill himself. Jovacic had a history of domestic violence in previous relationships. Back in 2013, Jovacic also punched his then girlfriend, breaking her nose. He was found guilty of disorderly conduct. He was sentenced to time served and ordered to pay a $100 fine and was also ordered to take anger management classes. Records say the night before the shooting, Jovacic and his wife went to dinner at the Burntwood Tavern, followed by a night of drinking at the Cashmere Cricket and Christie's Bar in Cuyahoga Falls. According to his wife, Jovacic was very intoxicated when they left Christie's. They went back home, and he passed out on the bedroom floor. At some point during the night, Jovacic woke up and left. He bought a six-pack of beer and then drove to Berkeley's home. He repeatedly knocked on her front door until he shattered the lower part of the glass screen door. The disturbance woke the woman up. When she unlocked the door, Jovacic rammed the door open, knocking Berkeley to the ground. During the fight, he punched, kicked, choked her, and ripped several clumps of her hair out of her head. Berkeley's dog intervened and distracted Jovacic long enough for the victim to break away from the fight and run upstairs. When she got upstairs, she grabbed her police-issued gun from its holster and fired two shots at the suspect. He started to... He started to turn the muzzle, and it was turning towards me. And I thought, oh my God, he's gonna kill me with my own gun. Monroe Falls police were in Berkeley's driveway when they heard the gunshots. They ran inside and found the woman in the fetal position. The officers went upstairs and found Jovacic lying on the floor. An ambulance took him to Akron City Hospital, where he died. The Summit County Medical Examiner found Jovacic died from two gunshot wounds to the abdomen. Monroe Falls Police have not provided any information on what happened inside the home, but investigators suspected that Jovacic was under the influence when he broke into the officer's house. The bottom window of the front door was shattered from the inside. Police and state agents working the crime scene collected evidence throughout the morning. 
investigators marked several pieces of evidence outside the home, including two beer bottles and a wooden stick. James Polak, a prosecutor spokesman, said the office was not currently investigating the case, but could become involved at the request of Monroe Falls Police. Polak said the prosecutor's office reviews most officer-involved shootings, but this one had different circumstances since the officer was off duty and worked in another county. The Monroe Falls mayor believed that Berkeley acted appropriately and in her best interest. He said, everyone has a right to defend themselves. No one has a right to attack another person. You can only imagine what she's going through. The officer was placed on administrative leave with pay. She was later not charged for the murder of her ex-boyfriend. A quick-thinking young hero has been praised after dialing triple zero to help his dad and sister, who had a quad accident. After his dad's accident, Nicholas Folks, aged 10, from Eskdale, Australia, can be heard bravely speaking to a triple zero operator to save his unconscious dad. Yep. Okay, tell me exactly what's happened. Um, so my sister and my dad were riding the quad. Yeah. And my dad sat, rolled the quad. Yeah. And his eyes are at the top of his head and his breathing sounds like he's... Okay, are you with Dad now? Um, no, I'm at the home phone. Okay, is Mum or anyone else there with you? Mum's at work. She's at work. Okay. Is your sister my with you? She's hurt. Okay, I'm going to help you, okay? So you've gone back to the house, is that right? Yes, they're okay. just outside the house. So just outside? They're only five metres away. Okay, so they're nice and close, that's good. Okay, and now I'm going to ask some questions. Are there any chemicals or other hazards involved? No. No? Okay. Is anyone trapped? Um, no. Okay. And do they appear to be completely awake? Um, my sister is, but my dad's laying on the ground. Is he awake? I, I don't think so. I think he, I think he's knocked out. He's knocked out. Okay. Now, um, are there any obvious injuries? Um, no. No, okay. Is there any serious bleeding? No, no. I don't think any. Okay. Were they wearing helmets? Ah, uh, sadly, no. No, okay. Do you have a mobile number that I can call you on, or can you take this phone to where they are? Um, my sister's here now. Okay, can you pop her on the phone? All right, here she is. Hello? Hello. Do you have a mobile number I can call you back on so we can get the phone closer to Dad? Um, yep, I um, can get my phone. Yep, just let me know once you've got your mobile. How old are you? I'm 24 years old. 24, I can. 23 turned 24 in February. So. Yep. Is your dad awake? He's, he is. He's moaning on the ground. Oh, okay. And where have you hurt yourself? Um, my, it's just my ankle and my hip at the moment. Oh, okay. I think it's okay. And how old's your dad? My dad's 45. Oh, okay. He's 45, so it's his birthday. Okay, we're going to get some help for him. And is he conscious? Yeah, he is conscious at the moment. And is he breathing? Responding. Okay. okay. And is he breathing? Yes, he is. Okay. Um, I'll just get you my phone number. Yep. My foot's in pain, but my dad is the one person I'm more concerned with. Okay, we've already got the help organised. Yep. Okay, I'm going to call you straight back on that mobile number. Hello. Hello. This is the ambulance service. Yes. Okay. Are you outside with Dad now? Yes. Um. Uh, not at the moment. I'm in the. He was waking up. You know, he was awake before. What do you mean? Did he pop out? Yes. He did. For how long? Um. Do you know? As soon as I went out there, he was. Okay. Um. No. Is he? Is he awake now? Um. Yes. No. Um. He was awake with me before. Yeah. And what about right now? Is he awake? Are you there? Yeah, I was. Are you yeah. there? I'm fine. Hello. Hello. Now, is he awake? Yes, he's awake. He's conscious. Okay, cool. I've just come home from work and I've okay. been like this. So. Okay. And you're his wife, are you? I am, yes. Okay. Now, we've already got the ambulance organised. Three, four, yes, you've done, done a really good job organising us. So, we're already on our way. Yeah, okay. Thank you so now, much. That's okay. Is he completely alert? 
Um, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. It's my daughter is just talking at the moment, so. Yep. And right. what part of his body has he injured? Can you ask I don't know. We've got him in the recovery position. I'm not moving in at the yep. moment. But just ask so. him, where is he hurt or injured? He needs to sleep at the moment. He's just, yep. You need uh, to wake him up. So I'll wake up. Honey, wake up. Is he awake? Yeah, he's awake. Okay, so it's important that we keep him awake. Can yep. you ask him where he's injured? Can he, is he able to tell you at all? Are you sore anyway? Are you broken? Okay. Are you sore anyway? No. no. Do you have any oh, Okay, and neither were wearing helmets, is that correct? No. Okay, and, no. and it's rolled on, on the quad bike? Yes, yeah, it's not on in at the moment. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, I'm going to put back on my door because I come in my neighbour so he can help me roll it over. It's, it's, so the quad bike's still on him, is it? No, it's not on him. It's not on him, okay. Yeah, what? And, um, at the moment, his pupils are going very extremely small. Oh what was that, sorry? Oh his pupils are going extremely small. Oh okay. And they keep going in and out of consciousness. Yep. I was on the bike as well. Yeah. My my ankle and my foot are extremely sore. That's all I hit. But yeah. He went down really hard. Oh, okay. And the bike basically fell on top of him. Yeah. And oh, okay. Just keep reassuring him. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Okay. Be all right. Just right. let me know if anything does that, change. That, that, look at me. What do you mean you can't breathe? Just keep <laughs> Okay, listen, don't don't need to scream. Okay, we don't want to obviously scare him. Okay, he's breathing. Okay, he might be finding it hard to breathe, but he is breathing. Okay, well, he can breathe because he can talk. Yeah, exactly. So that's what's really good. Okay. Oh, can he point to where he's sore at all, or can he tell you where he's sore? That's where where are you sore? Oh, okay. No, you need to tell me where you're sore. No, I'm okay. No, Dad, please. I'm okay. Are you sore anywhere? The, the one that I was speaking to first, is he the 10-year-old one? Yes. He did so well on the phone. He did so well, honey. Yep. I'm going to stay here on the phone. Dad, Dad, look at me, Dad. And don't try and get anything to eat or drink and don't move him unless he's in danger. Just keep it yeah. nice and still, just as you are. Just keep reassuring him. You're doing my, really well. My mom's keeping him still. Good. And he's right near the house, is that right? Yes. Yeah. How's he going? Um, he's just rolling over now. Oh, okay. He's trying to get up. Yeah. Oh, okay, I know they're trying their best to keep him nice and still. He's bleeding on the side of the head, too. Oh, okay. Are you Nicholas, are you? Uh, yes. You've done such a good job calling us. You're welcome. And is, you don't have any pets there that are out and about? Um, two. Two dogs. Oh, are you able to lock the dogs away or tie them up just so they don't get in the way of the crew? Okay. Do you know how fast they were going when it happened? Did you see it happen? No, I was inside and then I heard my sister call out and then I ran out. Oh, okay. Hello, how are you? So sorry about this. No, that's okay. Is he completely alert now? Yes, he's completely alert and going to top up. And not to yeah. say you're the interstate still, but he seems fine. He's just had a bump of the head and yeah. all that. But, um, Maybe the end, I just want to come and just check them over. Yeah, no, of course. It's always a good thing, just considering, obviously, not knowing the extent of the injuries. Um, they yeah. are on their way. I'll yeah. let you go to look after him. But if anything changes in between now and us arriving, just call us straight back on triple zero. And thank you so much for helping. I'm sorry, I just got home from work and I'm like, No, oh, that's please. okay. You've done it really well. Oh, thank Thanks you. so much for that. Thank Take you care. Bye. Thank you, bye. Nicholas told the operator that his dad, Paul Folks, was unconscious and had staggered breathing after an accident at their farm with his shaky voice. His mother, Cherie, returned from work just in time and took over the call with the emergency operators until the paramedics arrived. Nicholas's brave actions gained him recognition from the Emergency Service Telecommunication Authority Junior Triple Zero Award. He was one of 51 children presented with the accolade by Emergency Services Minister, James Merlino. The 10-year-old was very excited to receive his award. He was clearly scared, but he acted brilliantly at such a young age. He knew how and when to dial for emergency assistance, thanks to his parents. Folks and his daughter were released from the hospital a few days after the accident. Thankfully, they were not severely injured. He said the situation could have been way worse if his son had not taken his actions on that day. The proud father also expressed gratitude for the ambulance service and volunteers. In the early hours of August 2nd, 2015,
Tom Martins, the straight-laced 31-year veteran of the FBI, made a shocking call to 911. His 39-year-old son-in-law, Jason Corbett, was dead on the bedroom floor, bludgeoned with a baseball bat. Davidson County, 911, what is the address of your emergency? Um, my name is Tom Martins. I'm at 160 Panther Creek Court, and we need help. Okay. What's uh, going on there? My my uh, daughter's husband, uh, my son-in-law, um, got in a fight with my daughter. I intervened, and I I think um, he's in bad shape. We need help. Okay. What do you mean he's in bad shape? He's hurt. He's he's bleeding all over, and I I may have killed him. You know? All right. Okay. Let's um back up here just a minute. Give me your address again. Make sure I got it right. One six zero. Uh huh. Panther Creek Court. What is your name? My name is Tom Martin. All right, Tom. Give me the phone number you're calling from. Two times, please. I don't know. Um, what's the phone number I'm calling from? I, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm I'm the uh, father. I'm visiting. Uh, I I don't know. Was he drinking? Uh, yes, he had been drinking during the course of the day. I mean, My partner's dispatching the, the uh, ambulance in the office while I get the information. Okay. All right. Are you right with him now? I am. How old is he? How old is he? 39. All right. Is he conscious at all? No. Is he breathing? I can't tell. All right. What I need for you to do is I need someone to roll him onto his back. Flat on his back. All right. Tell me what happened. Did you hit him in the head or? I hit him in the head. With what? With a baseball bat. With a baseball bat. Yes, ma'am. He was choking. He was choking my daughter. He said, "I'm going to kill her." All right. We are sending the paramedics to help you now. Where's right. the baseball bat at? It's in the bedroom here with me. Okay. Just don't touch it anymore, okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. He is still on his back. All right, I need you to make sure that his mouth and nose are clear. It's a mess. I know, you need to clear it. Okay. Okay. All right, everything is clear? Yeah, as clear as I can get. He's covered in blood. All right, listen carefully. I'll tell you how to do chest compression. Yeah. All right, make sure that he's flat on his back with no pillows under his head. Yeah. Place the heel no of your hand. No pillows under his head. No, nothing under his head. Yeah, got it. All right. First of all, tell your daughter to go unlock the door and turn on the front porch light. Place the heel of your hand on the breastbone in the center of his chest, right between the nipples. I'm somewhat familiar. Okay, well, I have to give the instructions. You just go ahead and do it if you know what to do. Put the other hand on top of that hand. Yeah. Pump the chest hard and fast at least twice per second, two inches deep. Yeah. Let the chest come all the way up between the pumps. We're going to do this 600 times or until help can take over. Count out loud so that I can count with you. I'll set a pace for you. One, two, three, four. Hey, are you with me? All right, listen to me. I need you to calm down so that we can help him, okay? All right, your dad's going to need some help pumping. I need you to get ready to pump, okay? When he gets to 200 pumps, you're going to take over. He can show you how to place your hands, but I need you to stay calm. Certified. I, I just can't think. Okay, you have to stay calm. Let your training take over. We need to, we need to try and do, do this to help him. Okay. Okay. All right. Keep your dad pumping. One, two, three, four. That rate. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. Good. You're about halfway there. Okay. This is like I've got lights here. Okay. Just keep, just keep going. Don't stop. Going. All right, sir. Yes. All right, take your daughter and back away and let them do their job. Let, let, let them do their job. Try and keep her calm, okay? Okay. Y'all did a good job. Molly, Molly, let, let, them do their, let them do their job. Okay, they're here now. Okay. Can you take Molly out of the room? Okay, Molly. She suggests we get out of the room. Okay, are you okay? As much as possible, I understand. I understand. I understand. As much as possible, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. All right. Um, law enforcement's on the way.
If I can do anything else, just let me know, okay? Okay. All right, call us back if you need us. At 24, Molly Martins moved to Limerick, Ireland to work as a live-in nanny for Jason Corbett, a 32-year-old widower. She spent her days taking care of his children, three-and-a-half-year-old Jack and one-and-a-half-year-old Sarah after his wife, Margaret Mags Corbett, died suddenly when Sarah was just a few months old. Molly grew up primarily in Knoxville, Tennessee, the second of four children and the only girl. Family members described her as intelligent, sociable, and stubborn. Molly had played the caretaker role since she was a toddler. She doted on her brothers, babysat neighborhood kids, and looked after younger relatives with great care. Jason and Molly got engaged on Valentine's Day 2010 and married in her hometown on a scorching day in June of 2011. The happy family moved to Davidson County in North Carolina. Molly took care of the children, volunteered at their school, and coached a children's swim team in metal lens. Jason assumed a demanding role at an underperforming packaging plant. Molly had everything except for one thing, custody over Sarah and Jack. During their marriage, both Molly and Jason consulted lawyers with questions about it. However, Jason refused to make her the children's legal mother. According to Molly, Jason grew addicted to the narcotic of domination. The first few months, she brushed it off. However, as time went on, things got worse. Following Jason's murder, the case was featured on 2020. Paranoid that I would develop some feelings for someone else and or that somebody would look at me the wrong way. He was worried you were going to leave him for another man. Um, he was worried about a lot of things. You know, he'd come home from buying new golf club for $500 and he'd open the fridge and there would be a case of raspberries and that would, that would be it. We can't afford raspberries and he would throw the raspberries on the floor. Molly said the fights would escalate and the kids witnessed that. Are you finished with your dinner, hon? I'm talking to you. No. Is this how you treat this event? You just ignore me? I said, I'd like to have dinner with my stuff. I'm talking to you. I shouldn't have to say it over and over. I shouldn't have to say, Molly. Can you guys get out the stuff for him? No, you're. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Here you go again. I'm talking to you. You're still going to talk about something else. According to Molly, she stayed and endured the pains of her marriage for the sake of the children. I never would have left the children. You know, I couldn't imagine. Sometimes I thought. Maybe I'm being selfish. Maybe their life would be better, you know, if they don't have to deal with this. But ultimately, I always came to the same conclusion that, you know, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be better for them to lose a second mother. On the night of Jason's fateful incident, Molly's parents, Tom and Sharon, drove and stayed the night with their daughter and son-in-law. The Martins arrived and came bearing a special gift, a baseball bat for Jack. A baseball bat? for Jack. He thought it was really cool to get any former baseball gear that was a hand-me-down. After dinner, everyone retreated to their respective rooms for the night. Around 3 a.m., Molly was awakened by a sound familiar to any parent. Sarah woke up after she had a nightmare. Sarah woke up. She'd had a nightmare. And she came down, and the kids were not supposed to come in the room you know, and wake up Jason. So they would just kind of stand outside of the door and like whisper until I heard him. When she got back to the main bedroom, Jason was angry with her. But he woke up and he was angry and he wanted to know why I had gotten up. And I told him it was because Sarah had, had a nightmare. And then he was just furious because Sarah had been doing this lately. And, you know, she just wanted to be coddled and she was too old for that. And I shouldn't have gotten out of bed. Tom described the moment he opened the door to the bedroom. He claimed he simply did what any father would do. It's awful. He has his hands around her neck, and he quickly moves to move her in front of him between me. And so he's got her in a, a chokehold. In the midst of the argument, Jason refused to let go of Molly and threatened her. And he said, I'm going to kill her. Then he starts to edge toward the master bathroom which has a door. And my thought was, if he gets that door between me and him, then she's dead and there's nothing I can do about it. And 
And so I reached around and I hit him in the back of the head with the baseball bat. And what happened when you hit him? If he could have gotten angrier, he did. The blow to the head didn't stop Jason. He kept dragging Molly to their main bathroom. He makes it to the bathroom, but I'm too close. He can't close the door. And I'm in the bathroom with him, and I hit him again. I mean, I have room now. And I hit him hard in the back of the head again. You hit him hard? Yep, I did. He still got her by the throat, but he changes tactics. He decides to come back at me. And I'm swinging the bat. And he catches the bat in his hand and he sends me flying across the room. Jason just grabbed the bat away. It was like it was nothing. He could choke me with one hand and grab the bat with the other, and he was just so much stronger. And I was screaming, don't hurt my dad, don't hurt my dad. And I thought, he's gonna hit my dad with the bat, and that's it. He's gonna kill my father. So I get up, and I rush him, and I grab the bat with two hands, and I hang on for dear life. And I'm trying to hit him with the bat, and hit him with my elbow, and hit him with my fist, or anything else, but I'm gonna hang on to that bat. And he goes down. He went down. He went down. And then I realized, okay, he's not gonna get up. Okay, looks like the threat is over. During the trial, the state offered a different narrative, one that didn't include self-defense. Crushing his skull with that brick, she had anger to assuage and resentment to address, and she addressed those on his head. What you are saying, is that Tom and Molly beat Jason after he was already down, yes. when he was no longer a threat. Absolutely. Yes. The physical evidence suggested that he was still being struck in the head after he went down. The prosecution relied heavily upon forensic evidence, including photographs of Jason's body and the undeniably violent fight scene. Forensic experts testified that the sheer brutality of the beating, Corbett was bludgeoned 12 times, suggested of one-sided assault not self-defense. Neither Martin's nor his daughter were injured or bore signs of a struggle. One juror vomited when a photograph of Jason's skull was shown. The state called in an expert in bloodstain pattern analysis. Among other things, he testified that Jason was descending to the floor as he was being hit. Based off the evidence that was presented, there was no doubt in my mind that I made the right choice. The state suggested in his closing argument that Tom and his daughter delayed calling 911 and came up with their story. The father and daughter were found guilty and were sentenced to 20 to 25 years each on the charge of second degree murder. However, the story doesn't end there. Tracy Corbett Lynch, Jason's sister, never believed the Martin's version of the events. What Tom Martin's claimed was that he came up to the room and there was an argument, um, but there were no bruises on either of them, no mark the blood that were on, was on them was Jason's blood, um, no torn clothes, nothing at all. Um, and what I believe happened is a different story. Would you like to share it with us? Um, well, I believe that Molly Martin's planned to kill Jason um, and that all the evidence pointed towards it. I was disappointed there wasn't a first degree charge. Um, I believe that, I know that Jason had a bag packed um, with the kids' clothes. Uh, he was going to leave, he'd been looking up flights, um, that he had been drugged, and the toxicology report shows the drugs in his system. And those drugs come from, you suspect, came they from? Were, they were prescribed to Molly Martins right. on the Friday before Jason was murdered. You think he might have, she might have spiked his food yes, or drink? Yes, absolutely, and, and that's that, what I believe. And that he was asleep? Yeah, that then... he was asleep, and that he was hit in, the, hit in bed while he was asleep, and that Molly Martins um, hit him you know, to with an inch of his life uh, with the brick. And I believe she went and got her father as he lay dying. And her father came up and did hit Jason with the baseball bat. And there were post-mortem hits on Jason's body um, afterwards. And I believe they left him to die. I believe that, you know, they waited to call 911 um, when the EMT arrived. Um, you know, and they gave evidence that Jason's body was cold. Um, I believe they left Jason to die before they called 911. 
I think Jason was probably dead a long time before they actually called 911. In February 2020, the North Carolina Court of Appeal ruled that both defendants were entitled to a new trial. The state's Supreme Court upheld the decision and a retrial was ordered after ruling that evidence that had not been allowed in the original trial meant the Martins did not receive a fair hearing. A new one-off documentary called The Murder Files, The Killing of Jason Corbett, is expected to bring a different perspective to the case, including unseen police interviews with the two accused of the killing. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting, and subscribe to join us in the next episode of True 911.